and um, and will be made publicly available on the Massey Programs website at UW Madison. So, without further delay, I'd like to um, introduce the theme for today, and then hand things over to our panelists. So our topic for today is North-South Relations in the Shadow of the New International Economic Order. And we have as um, two distinguished panelists, Giuliano Garavini and Matthew Som. Unfortunately, Ahmad Uzu is not able to join us. He had to cancel last minute. Um, but we will have Giuliano Garavini and Matthew Som's papers to discuss with the expert guidance of our discussant for today, who is um, Sara Lorenzini. So I'll give you the biographies of our panelists and of our discussant, and then I will hand things over um, to Giuliano to get us started with the first paper. So Giuliano Garavini teaches international history at Roma Tre University in Rome. He has mainly written about European integration, decolonization, and the global south, as well as the history of energy and petroleum. He's the author of a book which is, um, in many senses, animating uh, our conversations today because it's one of the first key books that really tries to um, talk about the European story in tandem to the story of decolonization. That book is entitled After Empires, European Integration, Decolonization, and the Challenge of the Global South, 1957 to 1986. That came out with Oxford University Press in 2012. More recently, he's the author of The Rise and Fall of OPEC in the 20th Century, which came out with Oxford in 2019. Matthew Som is a PhD candidate in history at Harvard University. Um, he is also, of course, the co-organizer of this uh, conference. He is also Canada Research Fellow and an affiliate of the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs and the Center for European Studies at Harvard. His research focuses on the history of 20th century Germany, Turkey, and the Mediterranean in a global context, and he looks especially at themes of economic development, industrial decline, migration, and the environment. His dissertation is entitled, Paying for the Post-Industrial, the Global Costs of European De- and Re-Industrialization, 1972 to 1988. And this dissertation, which I've had the absolute pleasure of reading several chapters of so far, it's brilliant, and it explores how policymakers and businesses in the European core attempted to solve a range of social, economic, and environmental problems at home by using their political power and economic influence over the continent's poorer southern periphery. So those will be our two panelists for today. Our commentator is Sara Lorenzini. Uh, professor Lorenzini is professor of modern history at the School of International Studies of the University of Trento in Italy, and she is the holder of the Jean Monnet Chair um, from 2018 to 2021. She has written extensively on the history of the Cold War with a focus on North-South relations. Some of her books include Una strana guerra fredda, lo sviluppo le relazioni nord-sud, which came out with uh, Il Mulino in 2017. And um, another book entitled L'Italia e il Trattato di Pace del uh, 1947, 1947, which came out with Il Mulino in 2007. Um, most recently, she published um, a really exciting book that I have right here on my desk. I didn't plan this, but it is here. Um, Global Development, a Cold War History, Princeton University Press 2019. And she's currently working on a history of dam construction in Africa. So I'm delighted to welcome the three of you. We're going to start with uh, Giuliano Garavini, whose paper is entitled North Sea Oil, Thatcher's struggle against the third world and the logic of privatization. Thank you, Giuliano. Okay, can you hear me? Fine. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, Giuliana and Matthew. Giuliana, I never met her personally, and Matthew I did in Rome, uh, and obviously also Sarah uh, as a commentator. I want to thank them for having uh, brought together this uh, 
the right group uh, of scholars uh, in discussing an important theme. I'm not thanking them for disrupting uh, my <laughs> vacations because I'm actually in an island called Ponza. If you ever come in Italy during summer, come visit Ponza, it's a lovely place. And the internet connection also seems to work well, so you can even work from Ponza. Anyways, uh, um, the, 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 the think piece uh, I've sent sort of derives uh, some ideas uh, from my book uh, on OPEC, especially the mm -hmm. chapter on uh, the so-called counter shock uh, of the 1980s when the oil prices dropped very rapidly uh, in the middle of the 1980s. And it also stems from the fact that I want to dedicate, I don't know uh, exactly how and what it will turn out in, uh, but I want to dedicate part of my future research to the privatizations uh, in Europe, and especially to privatizations uh, in Italy. In fact, uh, the privatizations of state-owned companies uh, in Western Europe, uh, but also in fact later in Eastern Europe from uh, the beginning of the 1980s to the end of the 1990s were possibly the most important episode of, at least from the point of view of their value of privatizations worldwide. My own country, Italy, was actually at the forefront of this process within uh, the countries of the OECD. Uh, if you measure the value of privatization uh, as a percentage of GDP, Italy actually ranks third in the world after Australia, which I didn't know about, uh, and the United Kingdom, which I actually expected. Uh, and also in absolute terms, in terms of the value of privatizations, Italy ranks third in the OECD after Japan, and once again after Great Britain, the United Kingdom. In fact, this process of uh, privatization started off uh, uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, the very beginning of the 1980s. And from my point of view, at least, uh, I've never really studied what the welfare state is. From, from my point of view, uh, privatizations contributed to a radical transformation of whatever the welfare state is. Uh, uh, in Western Europe, there were, in fact, uh, many state companies that offered uh, key public services uh, ranging from uh, mobility, think about the highways, think about the railways, the provision of energy, bringing electricity to European citizens, to telecommunications, so building up the network, uh, uh, phone companies were basically state-owned companies. And I suggest that these companies and the services they provided were an integral part of the European welfare state. Or if you want to use another term of the developmental state, a term that has been used by some uh, of uh, the, those who spoke before me. And so, if this is true, their privatization was an integral part of uh, what the organizers of this conference uh, have called social justice uh, remade. So since Great Britain had such a prominent position, because it was actually the first country, at least in Western Europe, uh, to privatize key public services, I think what happened in Great Britain offers an important uh, insight uh, into how the privatizations came about and what was the logic behind them. I'm, I, I, I try, I mean, it's kind of an impossible enterprise, but I tried in the paper to link uh, uh, natural resources, shifts uh, in foreign policy, uh, and in a way shifts in political economy, in the political economy of the developmental state. And in particular, I tried to link the internal struggle by the conservative government led by uh, Margaret Thatcher uh, 
against workers' organizations and workers' unions and against state-owned companies with the external struggle against uh, uh, the new international economic order, which was in many ways a state-led approach to the reform of international economics. Now, uh, some elements of my thesis are these. The first is that petroleum was the most important commodity and the most important energy source globally during the 1970s. And it was the trigger for this monumental uh, uh, crisis called the energy crisis, uh, or in Western, uh, the Western world, more known as the most, more commonly known as the oil shock, which in many ways empowered the countries that uh, produced and sold uh, this very important commodity and energy source. And in fact, it is not by chance that this new international economic order that many of us uh, have spoken about and spoke about in the previous days, the declaration on the NIEO was approved in 1974. So just a few months after the oil shock of 1973, and that it was uh, an achievement done under Algerian leadership, which was itself a key member of OPEC and the key uh, oil producing country. Now, what's interesting is that the North Sea, even though not everybody uh, might know this, and in fact, I hope <laughs> that not so many people know this because they would be like me obsessed about oil, uh, uh, was the most crucial uh, new oil region in the world in the 1970s. It played a massive role in the history uh, of petroleum. Uh, and the Thatcher government that came to power in 1979 actually was the first govern British government to, to be able to use the financial resources that would come from the exploitation of North Sea oil. And I suggest that the Thatcher government used this newly found natural wealth to achieve three objectives at once. The first objective was to defeat the organization of the petroleum exporting countries by allowing uh, global prices to move downwards. And it consciously, which is something that you can find in the archives, I went to the National Archives and studied the reaction uh, of the British government to OPEC, it consciously used this decline in oil prices and the power it had to overproduce, if you will, petroleum to achieve this decline in oil prices, thus undermining the already feeble uh, cooperation within OPEC and between oil exporting countries and non-oil exporting countries uh, of the third world. The second objective that, uh, that the Thatcher government achieved by using this newfound uh, natural wealth from the North Sea is to beat the resistance of the National Union of Mine Workers, uh, by far the strongest uh, union uh, in, the, uh, in the United Kingdom. It had already uh, brought havoc on the governments, both Labour and Conservatives, during the 1970s, and it was in a pretty good shape. Uh, at the very beginning of the 1980s. But this massive flow of cheap oil coming from the North Sea allowed the British government to shift the power generation of Great Britain from coal to heavy oil, and so win over the boycott of mine workers towards coal provision to the power generation companies in the UK. So the British consumer never really had a problem in, switch, in turning on the, their lights and the electricity in their homes. And the third achievement uh, of, in a way, the third thing <laughs> that this newfound wealth allowed Thatcher to do was to start a program of privatizations of state-owned companies, which actually began 
with the privatization of a company that nobody knows about, what was hugely important in the 1970s, the British National Oil Company, Great Britain had created a national oil company, a state-owned oil company in the 1970s, 1975, precisely to exploit the oil in the North Sea. And in 1982, Thatcher government started privatizing uh, that company and then would eventually privatize most of the energy companies. By far, the privatizations of the energy sector in the UK were the first in Europe and the most important in terms of their overall uh, value. Not only that, the privatization of the energy sector in Great Britain allowed by this new uh, uh, availability of cheap oil and cheap energy provided eventually also a model for the rest of the European Union, even though with very strong differences that we have to account and we have to study. But in a way, it provided the framework and the model that would eventually be used by the EU in the various liberalization directives of the 1990s in, in the energy sector, but also uh, in the other, uh, uh, in the other uh, sectors. So this is to speak internally, but there's also an external component uh, to, it, to this, uh, which I allude to uh, in my paper is that this transformation of European welfare to the, through the certain state companies, especially, but not only in the energy sector, sector goes to, together with a new stance in foreign policy in a way to globalize this liberalization process. And I, an example that I quote, and which I would like to study uh, more uh, in the future, is the Energy Charter Treaty, which was signed in 1991 by uh, the European Community, the European Union, and it was precisely aimed at liberalizing and privatizing the entire energy sector all the way from Portugal to the former uh, Soviet Union. So while this is, you know, my main comment, and I'd like to take question on this uh, for, for, the, for this. Uh, um, for this panel, there is also a larger claim uh, uh, of the paper and something that I'm interested in, even though I don't know how uh, directly relevant uh, to uh, our panel today or to our conference, uh, the core team of the conference it is. And it's a claim uh, concerning energy transitions. Uh, you know, there's a very big discussion today on energy transition. Uh, my argument would be that all energy transitions have never been only or mainly technological issues. There is very uh, wide research today on uh, why uh, coal and fossil fuels in general became key to the industrial or in industrial revolution and that not only technological reasons uh, uh, can explain this huge shift in energy models. Uh, I would argue that this is a case in which, in a way, ideology, ideology and foreign policy contributed to eliminating, at least for, a, for quite a long while, actually, from the 1980s to very recently, uh, the, the hypothesis of shifts to a different energy model uh, that were very present in the 1970s of relying much less on fossil fuels and more on alternatives to fossil fuels, which actually appeared possible through state-led investment in the 1970s. So let me close uh, just by saying that I agree with the claim, uh, you know, the basic argument of the conference, which has been repeated by many before me, that the trans transformation of the European welfare cannot be seen as an isolated phenomenon, but in a way as a global one with different uh, uh, regional ramifications. The same goes for privatization. It's a global phenomenon which has peculiar, has a peculiar European aspect to it. But also 
it, it's a process that is hard to describe if we don't find uh, protagonists, both from the intellectual or political point of view or key industrial leaders. So this, uh, as others before me, was an effort in finding uh, you know, this select group uh, of key political leaders that had a, played an important role in this transformation. I realized while I was you know, writing the draft that in a way this brings back the centrality uh, of Europe uh, as a model for the, we're trying to provincialize Europe. And myself, I think in my first book, I tried to explain uh, European integration uh, as something that was deeply affected by whatever was going on outside of it. And here, once again, I'm claiming that what was happening within Europe had a huge impact uh, outside of it board, its borders. Uh, but I must admit that when it comes to this, uh, you know, this, e this effort to privatize and to liberalize, uh, there is uh, a strong protagonism of European actors uh, and of the European uh, Union uh, in, in general. So for now, I'll leave it, uh, I'll probably stop and I guess I'll leave my microphone to uh, Matthew. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julia. That was terrific. So I will hand things over now to Matthew. So, um, whose paper is entitled, The Toxic Detritus of Industry Beyond Borders, The Hazardous Waste Trade Between West Germany, Turkey, and the Global South, 1986 to 1989. The floor is yours, Matthew. We can hear you. We can't hear you. Yes. I think we can hear you now. Yes. Yeah, excellent. Um, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, the paper that I submitted to this conference is based on a chapter from my dissertation, which explores how policymakers and businesses in the richer European core, especially in West Germany, attempted to solve a wide range of social, economic, and environmental problems that they were facing at home in the 1970s and 80s by using their political power and economic influence over the continent's southern periphery in various ways. This was a twist on David Harvey's concept of the spatial fix, the idea that capitalist systems have an insatiable drive to resolve inner crises through geographical expansion, pushes outwards, and geographical restructuring. Those looking at the much bigger picture would rightly view some of these dynamics as characteristic of global north-south relations at the time. And indeed, I suggest that the southern periphery emerged as a kind of global south on the doorstep of the European core during this period. My paper today makes a more specific argument that, at least on the surface, might appear to be a somewhat oddball contribution to this conference. That in thinking about global economic inequality, we need to think more seriously about toxic waste. Trade in toxic waste went global in the 1980s in ways that provide a useful lens to understand how goods and bads, in the sense that the sociologist Ulrich Beck uses the terms in his conceptualization of risk society, were distributed between the global north and global south in the years after the international economic order, NIO. I want to emphasize at the outset that the toxic waste trade was not just terrible and darkly, a uh, darkly picturesque story, not just an illustrative vignette, though it was all of these things too. It was also financially and economically significant. It provides a perfect illustration, I think, of the exported and outsourced dark side. It's not just of a world of growing trade, shipping flow, and interconnection, but of something that we generally and rightfully think of as being one of the more positive developments of the 1970s and later, the growth of environmentalism, especially in the global north. Bringing toxic waste to the table today, so to speak, 
um, highlights the importance of bringing environmental history into our discussion. Not just those who care about the environment, but more broadly for everyone in this conversation, for scholars interested in economic development, global north-south relations, economic sovereignty, and all the other many themes addressed at this conference. Now, as a showcase for, for the shifting plate tectonics of global north-south relations after the NIO, 1988 in particular deserves a pride of chronological place that it has rarely received. And not just because 1988 was the historic high water mark of my topic today of the global toxic waste trade. Two figures tracing global north-south financial flows help illustrate why. 1988 was by some accounts the first time in the post-war era, in decades, that Western spending on development aid to the global south declined in real inflation adjusted terms. At the same time, this reversal in decades long yearly aid increases intersected with the rapidly growing trade in something that few experts paid much attention to before the mid 1980s, toxic waste. In 1988, Global trade and industrial toxic waste actually eclipsed classic development aid in absolute dollar terms by some estimates, as countries in the global south derived more hard currency from taking in the global north's poisonous industrial refuse than they did from traditional economic aid. This was a sea change if there ever was one. I want to add here, my point is not primarily about the exact amounts of these flows, which I actually have gone to the trouble of calculating. Um, it's hard to calculate aid flows and even harder to provide pre precise figures for a trade like the toxic waste trade that included significant semi-legal and illegal elements. My broader point is that the toxic waste trade grew quickly over the course of the 80s and that no matter what sort of calculation or source base one uses, by 1988 was on a similar a comparable scale to traditional aid flows. In any case, this was a bizarre twist on some of the development doctrines of the 1980s. In a world where trade was supposed to take primacy over aid, toxic waste occupied a surprising amount of bandwidth in north-south capital flows. Similarly, taking in the toxic waste of the rich was a rather strange form of self-help. The toxic waste trade was fueled by debt in the global south and environmentalist pressure on polluting industries in the global north. Mounting public scrutiny and increasingly stringent environmental regulations meant that companies in the global north were itching to find places to dump their toxic waste out of sight and out of mind. If skyrocketing foreign debt burdens meant that countries in the global south desperately needed dollars or sterling or Deutschmarks, some in the global north thought, well, why not pay their local elites and businesses to take in the global north's unwanted poisonous refuse and circumvent the environmentalists? The international toxic waste trade was quite small in the early 1980s, but expanded pretty much in lockstep with the Global South's mounting debt burden over the course of the decade. West Germany's uh, toxic waste exports, for instance, tripled in just three years between 1983 and 1986, quite characteristically for countries of the Global North, and continued to grow rapidly until peaking in 1988. Across the world, more than 5 million tons of toxic waste was shipped from the Global North to the Global South and the Eastern Bloc between 1986 and 88 alone. Greenpeace in 1989 dubbed this ecological colonialism and noted that in a dramatic transformation of older forms of global inequality, the burden of ecological progress in the Global North seemed to be sitting squarely on the shoulders of the world's poor and vulnerable in the global south, where it wreaked havoc on environments and people's health and livelihoods. While the most flagrant and widely reported excesses of Europe's toxic waste exports were to be found in sub-Saharan Africa, Western Europeans didn't need to venture all that far afield to find examples of what became known as toxic colonialism. Some Turks, for instance, wondered whether their country was becoming Western Europe's garbage dump and the latest hotspot of European garbage colonialism, chip colonialism, as they termed it. As it had for well over a century, Turkey relied on the West for capital and technology. But now, 
Instead of dependency being structured in traditional financial terms, most notably through debt, it took the form of barrels aboard freighters containing dangerous chemical substances. The story of a supposed alleged cement factory outside the southwestern Anatolian city of Isparta, one of several Turkish West German waste scandals that punctuated 1988, helps illustrate how the toxic waste trade resulted from, coexisted with, and even came to supplant traditional economic development projects, the type centered on old-fashioned transfers of capital and technology. In the fall of 1987, a group of industrial waste exporters in the southwestern German state of Baden-Württemberg struck a deal with local Turkish authorities in Esparta to export a jaw-dropping 100,000 tons of industrial waste by the end of the decade. To give you a sense of the scale, this was roughly 1 50th of the Global North's entire toxic waste exports to the Global South over the three-year high water mark of the waste trade between 1986 and 88. This massive dump in Anatolia wasn't slated just to be a disposal site. Instead, it was sold to the Turks and to the local population outside of Esparta as part of a transformer factory that would create 2,000 much needed local jobs and help industrialize a poor inland region. The Western European toxic waste exporters, in other words, justified their activities as a central part of shifting industrial production, not just waste, to the developing world. Indeed, they even claimed that the new Esparta factory would be transferred wholesale from some undefined location in Central Europe to Anatolia. Despite their misleading, spurious claims that German waste was somehow necessary to fuel this outsourced Turkish factory, that this Turkish factory needed German industrial waste rather than oil, for instance, uh, the reality was that the waste's primary function was financial. The transfer of toxic waste was a shortcut and stand-in for loans. The logic was straightforward. You import waste from the Federal Republic, store it briefly, and dispose of it in facilities built with the revenue from foreign waste disposal fees. In other words, the fees that West German industrial firms would pay to get rid of their toxic refuse. These fees would finance the initial investment, which would then be used not to produce tractors or transformers, as the project's architects falsely claimed, but rather to dispose of a constant flow of West German toxic waste over the subsequent years. In pure financial terms, Toxic waste supplanted debt. It stood at the center of a new model to finance industrialization in which the commitment to accept toxic waste replaced old fashioned loans. Rather than agreeing to pay a fixed amount of Deutschmarks to West German lenders, the Turks would merely have to take in a specified quantity of West German toxic waste. The Esparta case, together with several other German Turkish waste scandals of 1988, suggests an intriguing transformation in the vectors of German-Turkish relations since the 1960s, which I think more broadly illustrate uh, some important shifts in global North-South relations. Since they highlight the, uh, notably, the, the shifting geography of perceived excess. If state officials in Germany had viewed Turkey's excess labor force of unemployed and underemployed agricultural laborers as a reservoir of industrial guest workers in the 1960s and early 1970s, by the mid-1980s, they started to view rural Anatolia itself, the land in rural Anatolia, as a sponge for their own unwanted excess industrial waste. Naturally, the, these scandals were publicized in 1988 and resulted in outrage that led to this approach no longer working. In Turkey, the cement factory affair that I've just been sharing with you led the Turkish parliament to ban the import of all types of industrial waste in March 1988. Globally, a similar pattern emerged early the following year in March 1989 um, with the signing of an international agreement known as the Basel Convention that banned the transborder toxic waste trade entirely. Of course, the Turkish law and the Basel Convention didn't end the trade completely, uh, and in some senses pushed it underground, but they did alter its dynamics in important ways. On the one hand, environmental inequalities between the global north and global south persisted and grew 
after 1989. In this sense, the toxic waste trade as a symbol or metaphor or story retained its potency. On the other hand, the specific material and financial vector of toxic waste ceased to function in the ways that it did in the 1980s. Yet, even in the 1990s, the, the toxic waste and disposal industry retained the strange logic of economic development that had been thrust on the global south in the 1980s. But this time, in the 1990s, it turned it inwards to decommissioned coal mines, spent salt mines, and other deindustrialized spaces of the global north itself. In West Germany, for instance, discussions in the late 1980s about the future of the Ruhr Valley, the core of German coal mining and steel production since the 19th century, included serious consideration, including among West German Greens, of the idea that this former industrial powerhouse might best be transformed into the national toxic waste dump. This is pre-German unification. This was indicative of a broader shift. Toxic waste disposal as a focal point for economic development moved from the global south in the 1980s to deindustrialized areas of the global north in the 1990s. The notion that post-industrial regions of the old European core would make ideal toxic waste dumps gained further traction uh, in the 1990s in a newly unified Germany and in Western Europe as a whole. Margaret Thatcher's wave of deregulation and privatization in the 1980s actually primed Great Britain to receive an ever-expanding share of Europe's toxic waste by the 1990s. And by the 1990s, Britain became the main recipient of European toxic waste. Within a reunified Germany, it was the new federal states, as they were known, of the former GDR, that far more than the Ruhr became the repositories for the portions of German waste that were not exported to places like Britain or illegally to the global south. The toxic waste dreams of pre-unification late 1980s policymakers in the Ruhr actually became the reality in the former East Germany, where in the 1990s, old industrial centers in the East were repurposed as dumping sites, a pattern in policy that persisted into the new millennium and indeed to this day. In all these trajectories, 1988 was a central pivot point. The global year of toxic waste is I like to call it, helped to reveal the growth over the course of the 1980s of one of the little studied aftershocks of the NIO era, a toxic outgrowth of the North imposed on the South and a poisonous corollary to the privatization of economic aid and development efforts in the 1980s. At the same time, the aftermath of 1988, particularly the aftermath of the global ban and the turn inwards to the global North of the 1990s, suggests new ways that we might study questions of decline, of detritus, and more generally of what is left over literally and materially after industrial production and after previous instantiations of industrial society. If toxic waste was and is something that most people naturally want to get rid of, the changing location of where it was acceptable to dump waste across the watershed year of 1988 is especially significant. Specifically, it suggests deeper connections between deindustrializing regions of the global north and poorer agricultural regions of the global south that we have yet to fully explore. How might we tell a story linking deindustrialization and economic development in the 1980s and beyond? How might these connections figure in a broader history of the north south remaking of social justice? Environmental questions in general and toxic waste more specifically, as I hope to have shown today, provide an important and revealing lens to examine these problems. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, Sara, Sara Norenzini, it is now your turn to offer comments, and then we'll open up for discussion. 
do. I will start with uh, Giuliano Garavini's fantastic paper on the dramatic changes introduced with the discovery of oil in the North Sea and how in the late 1970s, this burst of the privatization of the oil industry in Britain first and in Europe then. Um, no doubt the discovery of the North Sea oil was a game changer. In 1975, British Prime Minister Harold Wilson in Rambouillet claimed enthusiastically that the West needn't worry about our blackmailing power anymore, given that now uh, copious amounts of oil had been discovered in the North Sea. And the G7 swiftly agreed on the strategy to adopt a divide the world rather than concede to the requests of the new international economic order. And here we must say that um, Harry Kissinger and Helmut Schmidt were exactly on the same on the same line, not much difference between the US and Europe in that troubled time of transatlantic relations. Um, but let me go to my question to Giuliano, which is about uh, the role of uh, the privatization of the oil sector that he describes uh, um, in his paper. Um, Giuliano, you mentioned in the paper several elements that are specific to Britain and that led to the success of privatization. A station is a tool to reduce state debt. And the, the third element that you mentioned is uh, using privatization as a tool to crush the power of trade unions as a revenge of sorts for the 1981 humiliation suffered by the British government in facing the coal miners. Hmm. So the question is, what weight would you assign to the different factors that you list in your paper? And more specifically, how much do you think that this last factor, the social factor here, weights uh, in this story and in the story you tell about the privatization of the oil sector, but not only? Um, Moving to uh, the second paper uh, that is uh, equally illuminating and really innovative, Matthew mm -hmm. Soam reflects on the problems of post-industrial society, in fact, in his paper and also in his uh, dissertation, I understand. And he deals here specifically with one dramatic aspect of global inequality, the ecological divide between the great polluter, the global north, and the great garbage dump, the global south. Um, we know well that this is just a part of the story because great polluters exist in the global south too. And it somewhat reflects the representation of the north-south ecological divide that was given back uh, at the time of the Stockholm Conference on the Human Environment, 1972. Um, well, what the paper does is offering a great picture. We heard also in the presentation now uh, <clears throat> presenting us both with the point of view of the state and uh, of the with the role of international NGOs, especially Greenpeace. Uh, it tells the story of West Germany uh, dumping toxic waste to Turkey. Father. <laughs> 
representation to take us further and pass the story of exporting toxic uh, waste to deindustrialized regions, to the Ruhr as well as to uh, deindustrialized areas in the in the UK. And there comes my uh, question. Uh, do you think, Matthew, that uh, just first to, first step, first stop on the way on the way south. Um, and in any case, uh, do you see this process you describe as uh, one of the colossal failures of the welfare state, or is your story more about the amorality of capitalism altogether in this uh, respect? So so far for the specific questions uh, to. Uh, the two very enjoyable papers. Um, I have uh, two more overarching questions for both presenters that, that could serve us for a discussion as a group more uh, also and not just uh, for uh, the panelists today. And the first question I ask as a Cold War historian and uh, well, it simply would be, oh, where is the Cold War in your narrative? <clears throat> but more specifically, I will try to articulate it. You see, climate state of the other happening after nineteen eighty nine. And if so, do you think that this is connected with the end of the Cold War? Mm. So, uh, to put it differently, for instance, does the failure of the state in socialist Eastern Europe have an impact on the demise of the European welfare state? Provided that we can talk of one European welfare state, which is something that uh, um, we keep it as a... Um, as a reference point, but it's, um, it's another question altogether, the, the existence of one European model of welfare state. I doubt there is just one. <clears throat> anyway, um, the second question. The second question is rather about the interplay of deep forces and individuals in history. And uh, you also in the presentation, especially Giuliano has uh, mentioned that already. Um, well, I must say that I love the example. In the mid 1960s, are becoming worrisome for the whole system in the 1970s and increasingly uh, so in the 1980s. But within this uh, very uh, interesting and narrative, what do do you think uh, is the role for individuals? Do you think there is a specific role for individuals? Because both yesterday and today, for example, Margaret Thatcher seems to be the real bad guy here. Um, is it really so? Was she so crucial in the demise of the welfare state, not only in England, but also elsewhere uh, in Europe? So I think I can uh, stop here. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to your uh, responses. Thank you again. Uh, quickly, Sarah, I missed, there, there's been some static in, in the audio. I missed the first part of your question to me. There was something at the end about the welfare state in my paper, but I missed it up to then. Specifically. 
to be just together not uh, a specific uh, for European welfare state model. I, I'm still having trouble hearing and I see from the chat that other people are too. I wonder if you could, uh, if you have it handy, if you could copy paste it into the chat um, just to type the question, then I'll be able to read it and uh, so will others. And maybe in the meanwhile, if Giuliano did hear enough of some of the questions directed at him. Sorry, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? It's it's very in and out. We do sometimes hear you. Oh, okay. Okay, but I'll, uh, I'll write it down. Connection isn't the best. Yeah, thank you. Good, yeah. Okay, thank you. So maybe Giuliano, do you feel you heard enough to begin an answer? Uh, yes, I think I got the the key parts. I hope <laughs> I got the key parts of what Sarah uh, said. Uh, so the first question was about what way, uh, what weight do I assign to the diff? So, so I said that privatization had various uh, objectives. Um, so what was the most important uh, in my point of view? I guess that was more or less uh, the, the question. Uh, I think my argument in general would be, and I must admit that this is something I'm just starting to study now. So it's not, it's not that I know much <laughs> about privatizations uh, uh, in general, but I have the feeling that they have often been seen as something defensive. So, uh, you know, there was a crisis of, key industrial sectors uh, in Western Europe. A lot of companies were losing money, even because the world had changed and become more competitive in the 1970s. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, there were increasing budget deficits. And so privatizations basically came about to save uh, these companies uh, with access to capital markets that were opening up in the 1980s, and also as a way to, 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 you know, to bring some fresh money into, into state budgets. Now, what's interesting is that in the case of the energy sector, I actually think throughout Europe, but especially in the UK, there was zero need to privatize uh, uh, anything. Basically, these companies were making most of the time quite a lot of money. There was no need to privatize the British National Oil Company. There was certainly no need to privatize British Petroleum, which had been nationalized by Churchill during the First World, World War. And there was little need to privatize British gas. Uh, so there was an offensive and not only a defensive element uh, uh, in these pr privatizations. Uh, of course, uh, it was a po policy battle uh, from the point of view of, uh, call them as you like, neoconservatives, uh, if you will. Uh, it was a social battle, meaning it was also an effort to win over uh, the labor movement that was quite strong in some of these state-owned uh, companies, which was pretty much intertwined with the process of financialization, which emerges during uh, the 1980s and then during the 1990s. And also what is more interesting from my point of view, it was an industrial battle to expand these European companies outside the borders of Europe. I read on the newspaper that, you know, something I know 
not much about, but uh, in Chile there's been wide, so uh, big uh, social movement, you know, pretty much close to a revolution against the uh, the current government. And one of the things they did is that they burned the building of Enel. You you might have no idea what it is. Uh, it's the Italian uh, uh, electricity company, which is one of the biggest in the world. Uh, it's also the leading uh, green, uh, so-called green power company uh, in the OECD, uh, and they burned it down. Why did they burn it down? Because it was doing what all capitalist companies do. They try to extract a lot of money from uh, people around the Chile, I think overcharging some. Uh, anyway, their tariffs uh, are tariffs that not everybody is able to pay. Would this have the expansion of this company that was a state-owned company that was supposed to provide cheap electricity to Italians alone, would this expansion have been possible without the privatization of the company? I don't think so. So there's also an element in privatization that is allowing these companies to, uh, to go global. Uh, the other question was about the Cold War, which Sarah rightly always uh, mentions. <laughs> I know Sarah well. She frequently mentions this issue. And we are in a, a period in which the Cold War is a, a significant uh, element uh, of foreign relations. And there is no doubt whatsoever, from my point of view, uh, that the decline of the role of the, the state, at least w within Europe, both West and Eastern Europe, is pretty much intertwined with the Cold War. In what sense is it the decline of the role of the state in Western Europe, which, um, you know, and the financialization of Western European economy that helps to bring down uh, the system in the East? Is it the other way around? I don't know, but certainly in Europe, the decline of the role of the state in the economy in Western Europe is very much intertwined with the Cold War and with the battle uh, uh, to win over communist, uh, communism in Eastern Europe uh, and, in, and in Russia. But obviously, you know, there's, there's elements that uh, when you look beyond Europe, can you say the same about China? Is the decline of the role of the state, uh, you know, how, how does this relate uh, with uh, with the Cold War, is it a larger thing that, 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 that than the Cold War? Uh, I don't. This doesn't really reply to the question of Sarah, but it's the first thing that came to my mind. The other question was about uh, deep forces and the role of uh, uh, of, of individuals. Uh, I'm interested in the most recent research, uh, which in a way, you know, moves beyond what me and Sarah know quite well, this, uh, and Laurent Varduze too, actually, uh, this, uh, you know, very bright picture of European integration that we've, we've often, uh, or at least the historiography until uh, uh, very recently, used to portray. It, it's a very peaceful and happy process. Uh, I'm interested in how European integration, the European community, the European Union in, is intertwined with the history of capitalism more in general. And in fact, Laurent Warluze alluded to the fact that the creation of a, of a European welfare state, in a way, managed also with key elements of it or some elements of it managed by the European community in the 1970s, might have been a way to save capitalism. At the, same, at the same time, we could argue that this new European integration, somebody calls it the new regionalism, which is very different from the one of the European community that emerges with the European Union at the beginning of the 1990s, uh, uh, is another way to save European capitalism. Uh, by setting the global rules uh, of the game and at the same time uh, liberalizing internally uh, uh, the uh, key sectors uh, of the European economy. And did Thatcher have a role in all of this or not? Uh, well, of course, she did have a role. Um, it's, uh, 
uh, you know, Thatcher is one of the most influential, uh, uh, I would argue, global uh, policymakers and politicians of the 1980s. Uh, but, it, it, you know, without Thatcher, would this not have happened? And uh, nobody, you know, nobody can really reply to the issue. But I, I guess I would go more in the other direction. I mean, the phenomenon uh, of this European Union uh, that was created of, uh, as the, in the beginning of the 1990s to save uh, European capitalism, you know, changing the model from the previous, previous one would probably have happened uh, even without Thatcher, even though you know, Thatcher had uh, a strong role in some key sectors and probably the model that was uh, used in Britain, at least when it came to privatizations, I don't want to go into it, but creating authorities and so on and so forth was very much used and Laurent maybe can comment more about it also by the European Union. So she did have a pretty important role. Thank you. Thanks, Juliana. Matthew, would you like to answer yes. perhaps uh, briefly some of the questions that Sara Lorentini raised and then we yes. can open it up for general discussion? Thanks. Sounds good. There, so there's a lot on the table. I'll try to be brief, but also try to address most of these excellent questions that Sara's put on the table. Um, to her first question about, I'll start with my paper um, and then move to the more general questions. The, the question about was exporting toxic waste to deindustrialized regions about finding the global south at home, or is it just a first stop on the way south? Uh, just the very short answer is I think this is an example of um, a richer, more privileged region, the global north, experimenting with something that's really quite nasty on a far flung, poorer region. And then when this is no longer possible, bringing it back home. Um, you know, this is a, a historical pattern that gets repeated in many, many ways in different contexts, but sort of experimentation out of sight, out of mind, um, far away. And then when you can't do that anymore, you do it on your own, um, on your own people, if you are the state. Uh, the question about, is it a failure of the welfare state? I think this is interesting because part of the environmental problem you know, and I think Beck's, Ulrich Beck's work in the 1980s, which I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, really gets at this problem, is that these questions of national and, and international environmental justice, which is at the core of what this is about, emerge at the same time that the post-war European welfare state enters into crisis. These are also areas that are not real because they are new conceptual areas in the 70s and 80s aren't really areas addressed specifically by the european welfare state i mean i'm not an expert enough on various european welfare states perhaps someone here is to say which european welfare states going into the 1970s already were good at um providing some sort of uh welfare in response to economic, uh, to, into environmental dislocation, but my sense is that they weren't, and that this is a whole area sort of beside next to the welfare state that emerges, and that the welfare state is quite helpless when it's faced with in the 1970s and 1980s. And some of my work specifically comes from looking at the West German Greens and the, the archives of the West German Greens, and they, they are trying to mount a sort of pro progressive politics next to the welfare state without really paying too much attention to the welfare state. So my sense is that these almost emerge as two separate areas, not fully in conversation. And uh, that's makes it hard for me to say, is it a failure of the welfare state or is it just a, maybe it's a blind spot of the welfare state? Um, you know, that the welfare state, to, to use Beck's really uh, useful way, you know, Ulrich Beck has this idea that previously we thought of things just in terms of goods, classic consumer society, but really in risk society of the 1980s, the real question is about how goods and bads, the sort of stuff I'm talking about, are distributed. And so my sense is that the welfare state 
is not as effective at addressing the question of effects bads as it is goods. Um, general questions, decline of the state as an economic actor. Uh, I mean, I think one of the, you know, the, my, my story is at the end of the Cold War. It's on both sides of the end of the Cold War, pre late 1980s and after. And the 89 divide, the end of the Cold War divide doesn't really figure so, so much in, in my story. And the state, the state is not really the main actor in any of it, 1980s uh, or 1990s, other than sort of setting very broad parameters. But even, even in those, it still seems to be at the mercy of these structural forces, which brings me to the second question, um, interplay of deep forces and individuals in history. Uh, you know, it, the chapter that my paper is based on really does look at these really pretty shady individuals who spot structural changes earlier than uh, policymakers do and exploit them. And then when the structure changes, they move around and exploit the new structure. So the individuals in my story are quite important, but they're not Margaret Thatcher's. They're people, you know, not, none of us have ever heard about. They're CEOs of, uh, of a kind of, um, you know, mailbox company in Zurich that packages toxic waste deals from German, you know, and then works with a Turkish former general who also has West German citizenship and these sort of overlapping, uh, shady, semi-legal, smuggler type figures. Um, so individuals matter greatly, but not, not the individuals we've heard of. That's an attempt to answer these very broad, thought-provoking questions quickly and on the fly. Thanks so much, Matthew. So we have uh, three people in the queue so far. Uh, the mic is now to uh, Laurent Marlouzet. Okay, thanks. I'll try to, to be brief. I have plenty of questions, but I will uh, limit myself to, to one question on each of these uh, fascinating papers. For Giuliano, um, I was uh, really uh, struck by the, um, the opposition you made between the Norwegian model, a kind of a welfare state model of exploiting North Sea oil, and the British uh, more neoliberal vision. Um, but I, I was wondering whether this opposition was um, uh, also something that you uh, found in the archives, um, or if it's something uh, more uh, recent. In other ways, uh, in other words, uh, was the Norwegian model considered as an example for British uh, actors or as a counter example uh, already in the 1980s? And for Matthew, um, um, well, my, my question is about the, the, the position of Germany on the European negotiation on the on European hazardous waste, because um, the um, uh, the the classical uh, account pits uh, neoliberal Britain against uh, green Denmark and green uh, Netherlands. And usually uh, Germany is considered also, the German government is considered also as quite environmental friendly. And uh, I was wondering where, to what extent those companies uh, dumping toxic, toxic waste uh, in southern uh, countries uh, had uh, have a, an influence on the German government in those uh, negotiations. Juliana, I don't know if you want. Go ahead. Why don't you start, Juliana, and then? Okay. So uh, Laurent asked me about the Norwegian model versus the, the British model. Um, so the Norwegian model uh, was basically entirely different from the British one, also because it was actually devised by an Iraqi. Um, so it it was actually a model of governance uh, of the oil sector that was very much based on the, on the model uh, uh, coming from the countries of OPEC, uh, in which uh, a state-owned company produced most of the petroleum that, that was produced in the North Sea, taxes were, were very high. Then it was changed 
uh, throughout time, it's not exactly the, the, the same model as in other countries. But I would argue that the, this Norwegian model of governance uh, of North Sea Oil is probably one of the biggest success uh, of a public policy worldwide. It actually made Norway what it is. Uh, uh, you know, one of the richest countries in the world, uh, the sovereign fund of Norway, uh, you know, it's the largest sovereign fund in the world. Uh, so it's a big success. And the British model is possibly the, the, the most uh, visible failure of a public policy throughout the world. Uh, you know, basically, at the beginning of the 1990s, it was the government paying the companies to, to, to produce uh, oil, which happened quite, quite recently once again. So there are very different models. Uh, but it's you know, basically something that is widely known in the, in, the, uh, in the literature. I would also argue that the difference of these models is also why Norway is not in the European Union. Anyway, this would be a long, uh, uh, also a longish uh, um, story. Uh, I'll leave the world, the, the word to uh, Matthew. Thanks for the question. I, I'll keep my answer relatively brief, in part because I haven't done research on specifically on Germany's role in the European negotiations on hazardous waste. So that's not an archival base that I'm working with. However, from what I have done, I do know, you know, in the German archives, for instance, how the German federal government was approaching this question. And my general sense is that they were trying to stay, the, the, gov the West German federal government was trying to stay one step ahead of the shady uh, waste dealers and exporters that I talk about. Um, and that they were, in a sense, trying to stay one step ahead of these scandals. So whenever a scandal emerged, they would try to uh, crack down on exports, limit exports, take a stance in policy negotiations, uh, claiming that this is not acceptable, that every country needs to take care of its own waste. Um, in other words, uh, in a way to sort of prevent uh, these scandals that I'm talking about from defining the West German policy position, which the German federal government was very, very anxious to avoid. They did not want to appear in the light that I am casting West Germany in. Um, how did it happen? It happened. How did this, my story happen? It, it happened, A, because the federal government tended to stay one step behind all of this. They let it they let it occur. And then when there was a scandal, they reacted. And two, probably more importantly, in a policy sense, hazardous waste exports and imports in Germany were governed by the states, were governed by the Bundesländer. So if it, this specific story I'm telling about the cement factory, there are several that I talk about in this chapter, but that specific one is, it's a deal between Baden-Württemberg and local, authority, local and regional authorities in Turkey. Um, as far as I can tell, the federal government wasn't involved at all. The, the government of Van Württemberg had the right to do this. The local authority in the actual town uh, municipality where the where it was located in Germany also had also was involved, and Van Württemberg was the main main exporter of toxic waste from Germany and was the main problem child for the federal government in this. Um, so I hope that is at least a partial answer to question as much as I can give. Thanks, Matthew. We have um, Stefan Tetzlaff up next. Hi, can you hear me? Is it? You can hear me? Okay, great. Very good. Thank you, Juliana. Th Juliana, thank you for the, uh, the presentations. Really fascinating uh, papers. I have one question each for Juliano and Matthew, and then um, tie in those comments into a question for the panelists and for the entire conference, maybe. Uh, so for Giuliano, uh, I read uh, um, uh, the uh, a book by Paul Pearson on dismantling of the welfare state, 1994, where he argues that Thatcher had an enterprise culture, right, bring an enterprise culture into Britain. Um, and um, so the... more competitive in the global on the global market but there's also uh, an internal uh, result 
which is that council housing was sold off as a result of the new revenues that came in from oil. That's at least the argument from Pearson. So what does it say about uh, the, the enterprise culture that was taking place in, um, in the uh, view is, I get the sense that you uh, that you have to do, talk a lot about the public discourses around the uh, subject of to toxic waste. Uh, so the um, the goods and bads, the way you present it, and it's it's likely a topic that is not being talked about a lot in in media, at least not for quite some time. Uh, so there's two things which are interesting. The the convent the Basel Convention in '89 did exclude radioactive waste from the toxic waste. Uh, that's one thing. And the second thing is that in 86, of course, Chernobyl happened, which expelled the topic of uh, toxic waste, but primarily of radioactive waste onto the agenda. Um, and then in a way, um, yeah, made this protest possible, uh, the protest by the Greens primarily. So how do you see those two um, pivotal moments uh, in the struggle? I mean, so Merkel, uh, Brought in the, the new Green Deal in a way just after, after Fukushima. Could you envision the, uh, the what was happening, the, the the ban of toxic waste, without the, the Chernobyl happening? Um, you know, is what, what's the discussion about this at the time? Um, so uh, yesterday, after the um, my final question would have been about the what we see now as the demise of the welfare state in the 90s, which was is often seen as a result of a new kind of social democratic politics of the third way, uh, which has been described by Anthony Giddens and by others, of trying to find a middle way between socialism and capitalism. Um, uh, but then i uh, researching more about this, I found that um, there was actually a discussion, and this was pushed in Germany by the Christian Democrats, by conservatives, especially Kurt Biedenkopf and Heiner Geisler, who brought up the, sol the new social questions in the mid-1970s, 74 and 75, uh, which is pretty uh, strong statement by conservatives to bring up, to use a term that is uh, normally been used by the social democrats. So, and I see this happening in, in other countries as well. In Italy, we have the uh, historic compromise between uh, communists and uh, conservatives uh, trying to find a compromise in politics. Um, and this may have been the case in other places as well. So what does this particular juncture of the early 70s tell us about uh, the social, the welfare state in Europe in general? Was there something, was there a larger project of social engineering going on where there was a compromise between left and right wing uh, politics? Thank you, Stefan. I think in the interest of time, since we have at least two more people on the queue, we'll take a second question and then uh, the panelists can bundle their responses. So next up is Amy Offner. Go ahead, Amy. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Uh, thanks so much for both of these papers. My question is for Matthew. I, I thought your paper was fascinating and raised many questions for me. I'll try to be brief. I wondered first if you can put this story about the 80s and the 90s into a somewhat longer timeline, just in the sense that, you know, toxic waste, of course, is a byproduct of industrialization. And I wonder how the geography then of dumping um, is shifting and how the function economically, the, the economic function of, of waste is itself shifting before the 1980s and how or to what extent that uh, phenomenon was itself being problem, uh, problematized and politicized before the 1980s. And my question is inspired in part by, you know, the fact that not knowing the European context, certainly in the Americas, it's being problematized, certainly by the 1970s um, in the environmental justice movement in the United States. It's also something that you see um, coming into historiography in the 1970s. The whole concept of Columbian exchange was a recognition that imperialism had ecological dimensions. Um, and I, I can't imagine that you know, the concept of e uh, ecological colonialism there was sort of unrelated to the kinds of argu arguments about ecological imperialism that you're um, finding later. Um, so the, the question, I suppose, is just how is this issue being managed and politicized before the 1980s? And then it, thinking about that longer timeline, um, how does that um, shape our understanding of the directions in which 
waste was moving and the imperial and capitalist relations that um, that, that movement reveals. You give us this story about the northward movement from um, you know the kind of third world into the deindustrialized regions of the first. And are there actually more directions um, when we look at a longer timeline? And the only other thing I'll say is that I think that this paper, together with some of the papers that have gone before, raise really interesting questions about how we think about um, what the outside is um, in Juliana's formulation, looking at Europe from the outside. Um, you know, and we've seen, you know, from some perspectives, it's Southern Europe, in some perspectives, it's the third world and, and so on and so forth. Um, in US history, there are likewise, you know, debates, for instance, is the US South basically the region um, that is like the gateway to the third world? Is it Puerto Rico and Indian reservations, like the formal colonial um, and imperial possessions of, of the United States? Um, is it instead actually pockets of uh, poor communities or deindustrialized um, sites within the United States? And I think that this paper gives us a kind of very interesting new way to think about this, that we can think about sort of sites of, of dirty industries um, as being one of the kind of circuits or one of the networks um, in which um, practices move around and through which we can think about what the outside is. Great, thank you, Amy. Uh, Matthew, why don't you get us started? Okay, so uh, wonderful questions. I'll start with uh, with Amy's first since I just heard it. Um, I, I I agree with everything you're saying. I mean, I think my my sense about the 1970s very broadly is that um, perceptions of industrial decline and crisis in the global north, in Western Europe and North America, made people more interested, more attuned to waste, starting in the 1970s. Um, that just this question of, okay, this, this system no longer works as it once did, somehow made people more interested in the after effects, the detritus. Um, and I would even, you know, characterize this more broadly and connect this to Giuliano's work with this question of spent energy, of what comes after an energy process. And by this, I, I mean energy very broadly construed, not just coal, gas, oil, but any energy process, any kind of industrial process requires energy. So what comes after this um, is A, I think an important part of any sort of energy transition broadly understood, and B, is part of the reason why you start to get this real interest in waste in the 70s and 80s. And you are right that it is a story that starts in the 1970s. Um, my dissertation, there's another chapter specifically on the 1970s. This is from the 1980s version. And the short answer is my sense is that in Europe in the 1970s, this is a less, waste is a, waste is a less global question. It's more of a European question that uh, addresses that. Um, so trying to be quick and coming to the, the first question from Stefan. Uh, Basel Convention, it excludes radioactive uh, materials. It also excludes recyclables and household goods. And in, indeed, to this very day, Western Europe ex exports normal everyday trash outside of, outside of Europe quite legally. Um, Chernobyl is absolutely central to all of this certainly fears about toxicity, about toxic substances spreading across borders. And finally, you give me a very good opportunity to say briefly why my story doesn't include radioactive waste. Fascinating story, whole other set of stories, but because radioactive waste falls under the policy framework of non-proliferation treaties, it's really a different beast from this non-radioactive toxic waste. Fascinating story, but a, a different one. Thank you. Um, Juliano, if you could take maybe two minutes, I'm so sorry to rush you, but we're trying to honor our time here uh, to address at least some of the questions that were posed to you. That would be terrific. Thanks, Juliano. Go ahead. Yes, actually, this time I didn't hear very well Stefan's question, so, so there's not much uh, I, can, uh, I, I can answer. I just wanted to briefly uh take uh, comments by charles meyer uh, regarding uh, fracking and the parallel between fracking in the united states uh, and what happened in the 1980s in the north sea i think there is a parallel uh, 
Uh, but what's strange is that the the the, you know, the 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 emergence of the fracking industry happened under the uh, Obama administration. So that would, that's a parallel that's intriguing, but also raises uh, uh, a lot of questions. Uh, and uh, Stefan did mention something about the third way being, uh, I know nothing about the third way, but being something in between, uh, uh, you know, socialism and whatever else. Uh, I think the third way from the little I know about it is actually, it's not, a, it's not about something in between socialism and something else, but it's just an expression of neoliberalism. It's not uh, an alternative to it. It's one of the ways uh, in which neoliberalism manifested itself, um, in, uh, especially in Western Europe. Thanks. Thank you so much to both of you. Um, and abusing my role here as <laughs> moderator, um, I actually wanted to ask a final question, which we may not have time to answer. But I was really interested in um, both of you thinking about the, the category of workers in your stories. So um, for both of you, I was interested in um, knowing whether you've studied the kinds of contracts that the workers in your stories are signing and know a little bit about who these people are. Um, Matthew, in your case, I was wondering about the real um, human um, costs of handling this toxic waste and whether that is something that figures into your broader story. And Juliana, I was curious about whether the North Sea workers had any opinion about the enormous strikes taking place among the coal miners in Great Britain and um, whether uh, that's a story that you followed in any way, whether they were tracking those strikes and had any thoughts about that labor movement. So I don't know if you feel you can answer in 30 seconds or less to do an you know, end of the radio show type of thing. <laughs> um, either one of you can, can jump in. Juliana, do you have a, a quick thought on that? Yeah, I can just say that obviously uh, coal mining is um, is an industry with a lot of workers. The oil industry has less workers, uh, so there's a big shift here uh, in the importance of workers in in the two different industries. But yours is an intriguing question. I have zero idea about uh, you know the reaction of your oil workers uh, on the strikes uh, of their comrades in the coal industry. I can just say that the, the, that sector, the oil industry sector in Italy, at least in terms of labor unions, is known as the most uh, uh, conservative one. Um, there, might, there might be reasons for it, but I don't know. Uh, I don't know much more about it. Matthew. Okay, Gary. I mean, that's a big, important question. Hard to answer in thirty seconds. Um, I, one of the reasons. I mean, this is also in my. Uh, the parallel to the environmental dumping story is a labor dumping story. I mean, one of the reasons that these West German companies wanted to get rid of waste far away was to um, to avoid increasingly complex labor uh, industrial safety codes that had emerged in Europe at this time. And so it was extremely dangerous work that made people very sick and in some few cases even killed workers in Turkey. Um, and the, you know, the, my story has a lot of different types of workers from the kind of more connected smuggler types to uh, unsuspecting local unemployed people who are somehow corralled in and told that they're just going to build a factory. And in reality, they're bringing in these barrels of, of waste. Great. Thank you so much, Matthew and Juliana, for these wonderful papers and Sara for your comments. Thank you. I'm so, sorry for the line. That's OK. We, we appreciate it. I didn't even get being... the messages. I said, so <laughs> it was really, really bad. It, sorry. Yeah. Internet connection is not anybody's <laughs> fault. <laughs> um, OK, so we are looking forward to seeing you all tomorrow for counter imaginary neoliberalism, inequality and resistance.
Um, it's going to be our final panel, and then on Friday we'll have our concluding roundtable. So thanks everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.